Hello, everybody, and welcome to Connected Knowledge from Upland Software on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright. What makes for an effective AI implementation? We've all heard of the potential, the productivity, and knowledge gains in the call center, for example. But what takes an AI project and makes it more than just a chat GPT wrapper? And what allows your people to flourish? Simon Chris is Asia Pacific's leading voice on the adoption and application of AI in customer experience. And he joins me this week with a blueprint for making your AI implementation sing. Simon, Chris, welcome to Connected Knowledge. So, so, so grateful that you have uh, have graced us with your time today. Yeah, hi, Pete. It's uh, it's great to have a chance to chat with you. I'm watching the Olympics uh, still going on as we record this, and my goodness, uh, the companies want me to be paying attention to their AI pretty hardcore uh, uh, right now. I. I'm curious what your sense is on the state of the union for AI. Before we dig in specifically to the the contact center in particular, how do you think the cultural implementation is going right now? Yeah, what a great question. I mean, uh, AI is one of those few technologies where the technology is growing faster than the human use cases for it. You know, we we have open AI talking about model number five, model number six, we're not even using model number four properly. Um, And so it's just outstripping. And unfortunately, that leads sometimes to a little bit of FOMO and uh, people just implementing it without really understanding the societal impacts. And, you know, I, I worry, I know that the French police and French military and stuff are using a lot of facial recognition software during the Olympics. How accurate is that? Are we picking on certain people over others? You know, um, many of us would have seen the the wonderful Netflix show Coded Bias. Um, that you know, we know that there's bias in these models and things. So the societal impacts are interesting, uh, but that's just as interesting for businesses as well because we see two extremes in business. We see those businesses that are suffering from FOMO. And just jumping in and you know launching these incredible applications, uh, but we just as much see companies that are suffering from what I call FOMUF, which is fear of moving forward, and they're just they're just they're just crippled with anxiety about you know the size and the dimension and the scale of AI uh, to the point where they don't do anything. Um, and so it's a it's a really interesting time where I think there's still a lot of marketing hype um, over true actual p- deployments, particularly in generative AI. It, it's such an interesting perspective, and I think it comes at just the right time because when we're talking about you know culture, we're talking about individuals, we're talking about human human creatures, and organizations are made up of complex machines of human creatures. And if we're looking at creating a substantive deployment of AI that really makes a difference, somehow we have to get the human creatures on board. We have to get the human creatures to trust and we have to get the human creatures to buy in. And that's the thing that I'm interested in your in your take on. How do you offer big wins to get people to really side with the potential that we have been promised? Yeah, I, I, th- I think it really starts with just general education about what AI is, what AI isn't. Um, you know, a lot of people see these large language models, the chat GPTs and Claude's and perplexities, and they look at them and think, wow, this thing is so smart. Actually, when you look at how much information is loaded into a large language model, it's less than a four-year-old has. Um, and because we have this aperceptive mass, right, we, we take in information in a number of ways, not just text. And so people simply don't understand and are a little bit afraid of it. And so I think one of the biggest parts of a win before you deploy any of this type of tech in an organization 
is to go and get the people on board. And that starts right at the top. You know, if the CEO, COO, CFO don't understand this technology, it's not going to filter its way down through the organization. Now, that being said, there's a bit of a groundswell that we're seeing from the front line coming up where, and this was highlighted in a recent report by LinkedIn and Microsoft, that a lot of people are using generative AI, but they're using it in the shadows. So they'll use it, but not tell their boss that they're using it, or they'll BYO their AI. So they'll bring their phone into work and they'll ask a chat GPT on the phone, and then they'll type that in to, you know, things like that are happening. But the mere fact that they're not disclosing it means that people are confused about what they should do, what they shouldn't do. It's one of those things in the, I think it was a line from the, the great movie, The American President, right? In the absence of you stepping up to the mic leader, uh, they'll listen to whoever has the loudest voice. And that leads to that sense of confusion. If, if, you know, as an institution, if you don't have a sense of, of AI purpose. That's correct. And fear, fear only exists in a vacuum. You know, if your people are scared, is, is AI going to take my job? Um, are we going to downsize? Is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? That's all on the CEO because clearly that CEO is not openly communicating to the organization, this is what we're planning to do with AI, even if that is just a holding message of, we don't know what we're going to do with it but we're starting to explore it to see what it can do for our business. And then later come back and say, okay, this is what we're doing with it. Uh, and in the absence of any of that, fear exists. You, uh, you know, I mentioned the, the chat GPT, the, the, the uh, um, inevitable chat GPT wrapper that becomes the, the injectable into so many application front ends. What is it about uh, uh, strong AI implementations that makes them stand above the what we're seeing in terms of the rush to market apps. So the, I, I mean, the the biggest, most obvious thing that everybody says they know about, but they don't really, is the underlying data that the AI is using in order to do its job. Now, whether that's big decisioning engines, whether that's, you know, an AI chatbot, whether that's um, AI-empowered knowledge systems, any of those things always rely on the data that sits underneath. And people expect AI to do what a human does, which is think illogically, understand this, understand that. And until AI has been taught to do that, it won't do it. So a great practical example is if you have a knowledge management system, um, and whether that's as, you know, simple as a spreadsheet or as complicated as, you know, as sophisticated as a Panviva system, if you're going to put AI in front of that, you need to go through that data because there'll be stuff in there that says, say this to the customer and something else that says, do not say this to the customer. But AI will struggle to know the difference, and so it will just serve up whatever. So if that data hasn't been simply tagged or categorized, it's not going to do the AI job properly. And everybody kind of looks at the output and goes, oh, see, I told you AI would get it wrong. AI didn't get it wrong. You just didn't tell it the right, you know, if you never told your child, don't go near the fireplace, they're going to go and stick their hand in the fireplace. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's that type of stuff. Um, the second one is just uh, a, a tolerance for failure. So most corporations, most governments don't tolerate failure well. We're taught not to, right? As executives, we're taught failure is bad, failure has to be. When you're dealing with a transformational technology, you need to have some degree of tolerance for failure. Now, often that means that if you're just starting out with AI, you set up a little cell of four or five people that report directly to the CEO. They're outside of the boundaries of the rest of the company and let them play, let them innovate, let them get it wrong. And when they're finished, when they get it right, then deploy it across the organization. 
but you either have to separate it out or create a real tolerance for failure in the organization. And they're, they're two of the big ones. The implication of what you're saying sounds like who in an organization who should own AI is the CEO. Yes. And I'm wondering how often in your experience you see that happen. Rarely. Usually it either kicks off with the CIO owning it because, hey, it's technology, um, mm -hmm. which isn't correct either because, you know, in the new world of AI, the IT team are not going out the back and spinning up five new servers and building databases. and th This is all in the cloud API call. So tech actually has very little to do. This is a business side problem. But where it normally winds up is where the, the first change agent happens, which is most often in that CX space, which is one of the reasons I focus on the CX space, is the CX has, you know, particularly the contact center, say, has one of the biggest opportunities, most reachable opportunities. And so they jump right in and, you know, AI winds up living in the CX space first and then later, oh, we'll, 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 we'll create a head of transformation and we'll put it there um, rather than saying, you know, the CEO saying, okay, I want a head of AI and I want them to lead this particular transformation and I want them to build my ethical and responsible framework and I want them to do this and I want them to do that. So we're just, we're not seeing that level of adulthood in, in AI. We're still seeing teenagers um, rather than seeing adulthoods. And, and that plays out a couple of ways. One of my favorite things to, to share is that when it comes to AI, particularly generative AI, it is a lot like teenage romance in that everybody's talking about it. Everybody thinks everybody else is doing it. The reality is hardly anyone's doing it and those that are doing it are probably doing it wrong. So, you know, it's, it's still very early days. We're still learning to adopt and organizations are still learning to adapt. And I'm just standing outside in my trench coat holding a boom box over my head. There you go. Yeah, please, please listen to me, AI. Give me, I mean, you, I asked you the question, who should own it? And you, your answer was rarely. Again, the implication of that response says someone's doing it right. Do you have a, an example of somebody who's who, of an organization institution that you feel like is is nailing it right now? Oddly enough, some of the large uh, U.S. government departments. <laughs> you're now you, you don't have to joke. Like you don't have to joke with me right now. No, no, IRS people like that are, are appointing definitive heads of AI. You know, of course, NASA. Um, you know, some of those larger organizations. We're also seeing some of the large banks um, here in Australia um, and in the US yes. uh, and in the UK doing that. Uh, and that's because they've had a history with AI for a little bit longer than the rest of us. They've been using AI to model who should get a loan, all of the systems that track whether or not a, a credit card transaction looks you know, weird or not. So they've sure. been using traditional AI for a while. And so they are, were a little further down the path of their maturity. Well, uh, hey, great to hear. You, support, you learn something new every day, I'll tell you. I'm yep. glad to hear that's right. Back when, back when it was called ML, right? <laughs> like, Yeah, well, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and rebranded. It's because been around generative AI has come along doesn't mean that all the other technologies are now defunct. You know, sure. I, right, I, right. Had somebody uh, recently, I had somebody recently who said to me, oh, we've made all this investment in conversational AI do I have to throw all that out now because generative AI has come along? And it's like, no, you right. just sweat that asset and, you know, continue to use it. So there's still a place for RPA. There's still a place for machine learning. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So you uh, you have a 12-step process that, uh, w that, that we want to talk about. And I don't know, I, I, I leave it to your uh, your tutelage to decide how much detail you want to get into on your 12 steps. But I but I, I know we want to walk through the 12 steps and, and, um, and, and talk about the, the important areas for AI implementation. Yeah. And this, uh, this uh, it's unfortunate that it came out as 12 steps because it sounds like a, you know, a 12 step program. Um, you know, hi, I'm Simon and, and I'm in love with AI. Yeah. Hi, Simon. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. 
Um, so it, it kind of starts off right at the very top with, and it, it, if you imagine a, an, a funnel um, with general AI awareness and things like um, identifying and prioritizing your use cases. And what most people unfortunately do is drop down to like step 10 of the, te- of the 12-step process. Um, and step 10 is investigate your how, or in other words, go out and talk to your vendors, go through your RFP process, select a product. And what I see a lot of organizations doing is jumping straight to what's the product, now let's shoehorn in a use case. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's partially, you know, uh, some of this is on the vendors because, you know, you, you go to a conference, almost every stall at the conference now is some kind of AI vendor and they're all saying, oh, come with me, we'll give you a 90-day free trial and we'll do this and we'll do this. And so companies are stepping into that without even knowing, is that the right use case, let alone the right tech partner? And so I always encourage companies to go back and start looking at these use cases, figuring out a way to prioritize them, um, whether that's just stack ranking them against business benefit, whether that's trading off business benefit with data complexity, whatever that is, um, risk has to be in that calculation somewhere, but prioritize those use cases. Do you, do you have a discernment process around figuring out what those use cases are? Because I, I feel like where we are on the, the adoption curve or the development curve of AI, leaders may be in a position where they're asked to define use cases before they know the, the scope of potential because the technology is very new. So back in the time of Socrates, there was a guy, reportedly, a guy called Mino. And Mino was talking to Socrates and saying, I'm sure I can learn everything I need to know about the world if I just asked you the right question. The problem is I don't know enough to know what that right question is. And that's exactly where we are with AI today. If I went into an organization, particularly to the executive leaders, and said to them, what do you want to do with AI? Their answer is invariably, I don't know, what can AI do? There you go. And so you get this, this chicken and egg. So that's why I was talking about always starting off with general AI awareness across leadership. Get the AI leadership together for two hours, four hours, eight hours if you can, and talk, have somebody that knows about this come in and just talk about what is AI, what isn't it, and what are some of the use cases that we're already seeing in a high priority? Um, and then get together your most uh, innovative people to look at ev- every area of the business and pull up use cases. You know, and that could be as complicated as putting cameras on the front of every city bus so they can start to detect potholes in the road. Or as simple as we need to put a bot in front of our 27 HR policy documents so that new staff that are onboarding can find their information quickly and easily. But you do have to go through and find these. What, what I tend to find happen is you will probably identify your first 15 or 20 use cases. And then once you start down the path, suddenly another 10 emerge and five over here and this area of the business comes up with five or 10 and suddenly you've got 40, 50, 60 use cases. But it takes, the use begets use. This would, would be my advice. Okay, so turning our attention back to the 12 steps, I think I hijacked you literally after step one. So uh, <laughs> let's keep walking through the narrative. Right, so as I was saying, you prioritize the use cases The very next thing you do after you've said, well, this is the use case we're going to go after first, is go and start scrutinizing the data that would be used to power that. Because as I said, you know, it might seem great to put AI in front of your knowledge, but if your knowledge isn't well structured, it's going to take you three months to go and tag all that data. So go and pick another use case. Um, keep working on the stuff in the background, but go and pick another use case. So you get a, get a little bit of circular stuff going on between steps two and three. 
Once you're there though, and you know what your use case is, and for any organization starting out, so please select one use case and make it internally facing, Not don't go external first. Um, once you identify what that use case is, start to articulate and socialize why are we doing this use case. So remove that fear, go out and talk to the organization about this is where we're starting the journey and this is why. Figure out who's going to do this, identify what a win looks like, then really start to deeply analyze the process that you're trying to augment because invariably we're looking for augmentation before automation. Um, document the what and the why, um, then start exploring any downside risk or ethical concerns or anything like that. And then go and buy your, your tech that you're going to do and move into your proof of concept. So there's a whole pile of work that needs to go on before you select your technology. It seems like the vast majority of the intellectual work happens before you've selected the technology. Absolutely. Yeah, the tech should just be the enabling piece, not the driver. That said, mm -hmm. moving from technology to, you know, from choosing your technology to making it a part of infrastructure and training and adapting the organization to it uh, has to come with its own set of, tell me there are steps, sub steps. Yeah. So I, I usually tell them to get through the proof of concept first. I mean, keep communicating through the proof of concept, let the organization know what's going on. Let it know we tried version one and we found some bugs and so we're going to version two and version three. And just let them know what's going on. Um, and then when you're ready to operationalize it, then actually traditional change management kicks in. Stakeholder engagement, lots of communication to the organization, all of the training sessions about how to use it, why we would use it, remove all the scaremongering that's going to happen that, oh, this tool's going to take my job. Um, all of that sort of stuff. Um, start to work through if this tool is going to free up some time, what are we going to do with that time? And what is the original CEO's message? Was the original CEO's message something along the lines of, uh, we're going to do AI, but we're not doing it just to downsize? That's not our key driver. Um, we're going to look to redeploy people. Yes, will some people's jobs change or go? That's that's highly likely, but that's not our driver. Or was there no real message and what it looks like is we're adopting AI just to get rid of people. So once again, it comes back to really, really strong communication. I, you know, I, the HR training development people listening to the show are breathing a massive sigh of relief because change management principles we know change management principles we can wrap our head around. And, and that should be a relief. We know how to make change in, a, in an organization. We know what to do. Everything old is new again. Everything old is new again. Just because we're talking using the word AI does not mean you don't know how to do the job. Absolutely correct. T uh, how are we doing at Upland? Yeah, look, really good. Upland were, were, one of the, were one of the earliest movers of the what I would call traditional knowledge management tools um, to adopt AI and to get it on board and to start to use it. Um, it's, a, it's a highly contested space right now. Um, you've got the, you know, the traditional stalwarts that really know their stuff like Upland coming up against um, startups that are kicking off and saying, oh, yeah, look, we've got generative AI. We can do this. But are they really doing it? Are they just putting a wrapper, as you said, around some old you know, group of PDFs? Or are they actually categorizing and breaking up the data? Do they have the governance models in place to make sure that data is governed safely and properly and all of those types of things? So um, Upland's right there. Um, the the biggest problem I can see coming for Upland, and it's the same problem that Microsoft, Salesforce, and everybody else faces, is there's technology as designed, but that's different to technology as used or as implemented. And so if people are implementing this stuff the right way, um, that's going to be great. Um, where, where they don't implement it well, 
how is that going to reflect on upland type of thing? Because there's there's primarily three types of AI, if you want to think about it this way. One is product embedded AI, which is what Upland have, right, in spades. They've taken AI, they've embedded it in the product. Um, it's it's there and it's complete. And, you know, it the way in which they've done it, it complies with all of their GDPR compliance and HIPAA compliance and all that sort of stuff. The second one is what we call domain-specific AI. And that's where you're going out to buy an AI that does a very, very specific job. As an example, that might be you're buying an AI that understands in depth the legislation around um, building houses in the great state of Montana or something, right? And, And so you want something that really just understands that. And a shout out to all the Montana listeners. Um, and then the third type is your general purpose AI. So this is your Microsoft Copilot, your chat GPTs, things like that. The interesting thing that's going to happen later is we're going to see an intersection of the general purpose and the product embedded. So if somebody's using the Upland software and the CIO decides to roll out Microsoft Copilot across the organization, what happens where they intersect? Is there a master-slave relationship? Do agents have two different co-pilot partners that it's working with? Um, And none of the organizations that I've seen yet have hit that wall of needing to figure it out, but we can see it coming. I mean, everybody thinks that the general purpose AI is going to be a panacea for everything, and it's not. It's going to be, think about it a little bit like seeing your general practitioner. Great if you've got cuts and bruises and, you know, coughs and colds. But if your, you know, three-year-old boy has shoved that crayon right up his nose, you're going to have to take them to a specialist. And it's going to be the same way with AI. So um, applications like Upland, having that level of AI in them is always going to be needed because it's doing a specialist job that a generalized tool won't do anywhere near as well. This, I mean, we're, what are we, two years on since ChatGPT yep. released? What does the next two years look like? You and I sit down 24 months from now. What's our conversation going to include? Yeah, it's going to be very different. It probably won't be you and I. It'll probably be our AI avatars our, sitting yeah, down. Yeah, our avatars are going to talk to each other. That'll be great. Sure. Um, look, I, th- I think the next big move, because we're going to continue to develop this stuff out, is going to be even greater visual AI than what we're doing today. So more and more things are going to ask for a camera feed, um, you know, to, to be able to look around the room, to be able to see. Or In other words, it's going to start to mimic human behavior a little more. So it's already listening. We know that Siri listens to us. We know Alexa listens to us. We know these, these things are listening. Um, even the OpenAI app itself, um, can do that. Um, Applications like Upland can listen to a call in real time as it's happening to, you know, surface the right information. So AI has already got ears. The next thing AI is going to want is eyes uh, because that builds that a perceptive mass for it. So if it has eyes and ears, it can do a lot more in the world. Um, And then ultimately it'll move to, you know, robotic fingers and the stuff. But so I think We'll see a couple of things. One, as I said, I think you'll see more visual feeds into the AI. Secondly, I think it will start to become more personal for people. So, you know, it it started out that a lot of this tech was big application and it was only when it became personal that people really started to accept it. So it was only when Alexa came into the house that Initially, there was that, oh, I'm not having one of them those in my house. It's going to listen to me all the time. Well, we got past that pretty quickly. And suddenly, we discovered that we could say, hey, Alexa, build this for my shopping list and add this to my shopping list and do this for me and turn down the music. And that was fantastic. So the same thing is going to start to happen with AI. In fact, I'm a little drawn back to the movie Her with Jacqueline Phoenix from about 10 years ago, and anyone who hasn't watched that recently needs to go and re-watch it. It'll scare you how close it is. Um, where we each have a personalized AI. 
And I think this will happen also in the workplace. So your Microsoft Copilot, for one of an example, your Microsoft Copilot might be a mid-30s male with a Colombian accent, and mine is a mid-20s person with a Chinese accent, and somebody else will want something else. And it'll start to get really personalized for people. That's my prediction for two, two and a half years, if it takes that long. The, when you talk about the next two, two and a half years, uh, the, one of the things that we see, and I, I don't think we can have a healthy conversation about AI uh, and without bringing up the, the sort of ethical considerations and the legislation uh, against it. And uh, I'm, I'm, we're going to have to solve at some level the data acquisition, the copyright issues. Do we have, do you feel like our systems are in a good enough place to be able to address these and allow us to move forward? Uh, if not, what has to change? I personally, I'm a believer that the horse has bolted on it. It's, uh, the, you know, the genie is way out of the bottle. Um, because we already have these models and they've already been trained on this data and you know, it's probably a legacy from when we invented the internet that it was deemed to be the public domain. So anything that you put on the internet and you published, unless you explicitly said that this is, you know, not to be used for any purpose and it's confidential, was deemed to be publicized like it was in the newspaper. So I think they're going to struggle to with these concepts of, of copyright and proving that this output over here directly relates to that input over there because otherwise you would say every output of every AI could be related back to that one little article I wrote, you know, three years ago where I used the word the, um, you know, but no one has a copyright on that. So I think that's going to struggle. I think legislation is going to struggle. I'm, I'm a, one of the people who's a bit vocal about the legislation that's going around now, the EU's AI Act. Uh, President Biden's executive order and the work that Canada, the UK, Singapore, Australia and Japan are doing on on this is they're trying to they're trying to legislate around the people who are building this technology and the people, but mostly just around people who are building high risk stuff. We all know, though, that people can use low risk built products for nefarious purposes. We know the internet's being used for nefarious purposes every day, and AI is going to be the same. So if a human somewhere really wants to be evil, they're going to be evil. And so I kind of look at the legislation at the moment, and it's like they're legislating one leg of a three-legged chair. And it's, you know, I, I just worry how effective and efficient it's going to be. Um, ethical concerns are huge, and I think every organization will need to set its own ethical standards. And that is the job of the board, not of the executives, of the company board, or of the government counselors, or whoever that is. Whoever is the governance body needs to set that, because it's an extension of the risk appetite. If you think about it this way, the ethical concerns that a company who provides services to disabled people and disabled workers, their ethical standards are going to have to be of a higher level than a paint manufacturer. Uh, just because the ability to do harm is so much greater in one organization than it is in another. So what you find ethical and what I find ethical is going to play out into what does this company find ethical and what does that company find ethical? I suppose you and I will have to table the results of that conversation for maybe 10 years down the road. Yeah. Probably going to take us some time to get there. But for today, Simon, thank you so much. This, is, this has been a fantastic conversation for me. I'm honored to have you here. No, this has been great, Pete. I'm uh, happy to chat with you and happy to chat with you again. This is a lot of fun. Uh, where would you like me to send people to learn more about you and the work that you're doing? Uh, it's really simple. Um, they can find me on LinkedIn. There's, I think there's only one Simon Chris, and if it says anything about AI, that's probably me. Um, the other option is they can go to my website, which is just simonchris.ai. Well-branded, sir. Well-branded. We will put all the links in the show notes. 
Thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. Thank you for your time and your attention. We'd love to hear what you think. Just swipe up in those show notes. Look for that feedback link to send questions to us or any of our past guests, and I will do my best to get them answered for you. On behalf of Simon Chris, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you right back here next time on Connected Knowledge. <laughs>